All right, everybody, we are past noon. We've got our slides up. Um, so we'll get started in a few minutes. And as usual, we'll kick it off with announcements. Um, anything to share regarding Forever Green happenings or other things that are of interest? <clears throat> Over snacks, <laughs> yeah, you're over what snacks? <laughs> snacks. No, <laughs> yeah, maybe rhizomes to get you on. <laughs> I got some samples downstairs, they could probably get you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what we could be. Um, Mitch, should, should we announce a new staff member onboarding? Please, yeah. yeah. Okay, hi everyone. This is Colin Curitan, uh, joining remotely, and I just wanted to share with the Forever Green research community that we are hiring our first field agronomist, perennial grains and winter annuals field agronomist, uh, and that individual will start on April 3rd, and his name is Matt Levitt. He's coming over from Albert Lee Seed back to the program um, where he did his graduate work here in the department. We're really excited to have him, and his role is specifically um, focused around this uh, program we have with MDA to support the de-risking of forever green crops, but he'll just add a lot of staff capacity and support for growers um, interested in uh, perennial grains and winter annuals. So he starts on the third and we'll be reaching out to many of you to, to link him up um, early on um, in his uh, work here. Do I need to find an office for him? I think we're on it, Don. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Not too much to share on the legislative front. We are, you know, the committees have been super busy hearing a ton of bills, um, but there's not even a budget target yet. So we are just still in wait and see mode. So Jeff Kirk and here. Mitch, just a quick note. Um, this is Peter LaFontaine from FMR. They're uh, having a listening session with um, Commissioner Peterson, uh, Chair Putnam and um, the lead second second chair on um, the House Ag Committee, Christy Purcell, down in Faribault tomorrow. So if anybody has contacts down there that you can turn out to go and talk about how wonderful Forever Green and Continuous Living Cover are, I think it would be a pretty impactful um, time of the legislative calendar to turn out those folks. So are you guys uh, bringing some folks down there, Peter? Mitch, Colin, and I have been um, talking uh, about who we can bring. I, I've reached out to a few folks. I know Colin and Mitch have as well, but I don't know if we have anybody actually teed up yet. Well, from what I've learned, and, and if there are any MDA folks on, on Zoom, uh, they can chime in. But what I've learned is that these, these um, uh, sessions um, are really important this year and that listening to the, the committees um, that we've testified in front of, they are really listening to what comes out of those sessions, right? So I think it, would, it is really important uh, to get and invite people to come to that listening session and, uh, and provide some input. Right? And I also, thanks for bringing that up, Peter. I saw that it, they actually are doing two tomorrow. They're doing one in Chatfield in the morning and then the one in Faribault a couple hours later. So there's a couple opportunities depending on where people are located. <clears throat> Jeff, were you gonna chime in? Yeah, a couple updates there. Uh, first of all, you know, you know, any listening sessions, you know, by the chair of the Senate Ag Committee is, is always a good thing to, you know, lend your voice to, you know, whatever's uh, important that you wanna talk to them about. So two announcements. Number one, welcome to my world during the legislative session. Behind me as we speak, they're actually running behind, but the legacy bill, which contains the clean water funding, which contains many great projects, you know, like uh, watershed planning and soil health, also contains um, uh, through Department Ag six millions for Forever Green. So uh, during the presentation here, I, you know, fingers crossed, you know, that'll be passed out of the, you know, Senate uh, committee that's going on right now. Second announcement, uh, you know, thanks for the help of, uh, you know, Colin and Peter um, who have gotten the word out, but to get the word out, uh, you know, other folks that may be interested, 
the continuous living cover markets uh, RFP is now open. Take, we're taking applications started last week. I know we have a few of them already. So within a week, uh, getting uh, some in right away, that's a great sign. So there's my announcements and uh, I'll uh, throw something in the chat to see what happens in committee here. I have one other announcement. I was down uh, in Albert Lee, Blue Earth, Fairmont yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, yesterday. And the snow is all gone. <laughs> It's black soil through that whole area, right? It's just a, a shocking change from, you know, white almost immediately to, to black you know, through the, the, the southern tier of uh, counties. Where's the boundary line? Well, I, it, it's uh, probably 30 miles north of the, of the Iowa line. Right. So we can start work, field work. <laughs> yeah, a couple days. Yeah, it was. It, it's it, the fields were black, mm -hmm. <clears throat> literally black. No cover at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see one damn cover crop. <laughs> well, with that, let's hear about how we can uh, address that potentially with Kira Clover. Yeah, shall I want to do it? Go for it. All right. <clears throat> struggle to switch between talking to the room and talking to Zoom, but I guess it's all kind of the same with the owl there, you know. Um, yeah, so thanks thanks for the invitation. Um, and, and mentioned Don for your uh, wisdom in picking a clover topic on St. Patrick's Day. And this is uh, what the, the most auspicious holiday of the forever green uh, cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so I'll I'll just kind of launch right into it. Um, Introduce yourself. Oh, sure, your thanks. Um, and your um, team. So I'm Brent Dizel. Uh, I'm a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS. Um, I've been with ARS for just under three years now. I started right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, which was an interesting time to switch jobs. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was a sophomore research associate in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate at the University of Minnesota. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, here in St. Paul thinking about, uh, more generally thinking about how conservation activities affect water quality in Minnesota's agricultural landscape. Um, because of my position as a soft money researcher, I, a lot of that work occurred through kind of a modeling lens. Uh, I'm really happy to be in ARS now and have an opportunity to do this, uh, to, I guess, complement the modeling with field work, which I, I feel like will help keep us into reality. Um, and uh, also involved, heavily involved in this, uh, John Alexander and John Baker, uh, both in the room here, and then Jeff Strzok, I saw joining virtually. Uh, I've worked with Jeff on a number of projects for a number of years and uh, enjoyed working with John and John. Uh, a lot in the, the last three years, and I think really importantly, I, I when I when I speak about this, I'm going to use the royal we a lot. But nearly all of the data I'm going to show today was generated by John and John Baker and John Alexander. Um, as I mentioned, I've been with ARS for three years. Some of these data are, are much more than three years old from long term research plus. So um, I'm grateful that they're joining me today because if you guys have any hard questions, they're the ones that were actually there collecting those data. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have to say about that. Um, John Alexander, many of you I'm sure know, uh, he did his PhD in the Land Atmospheric Science Program, graduated last summer, and is now a, a postdoc with Josh Campbell uh, in the ARS. So we're happy that he stuck around with us. Um, and then the, the results that I'll be showing today um, and, and some of the work I'll be talking about, some is funded by Forever Green uh, uh, through funding that started last, last year. Uh, and then a lot of the previous work was supported by the Minnesota corn growers uh, with ARS filling in around the gaps. Um, I know this is a, a sympathetic audience, but I, I think it is also always useful to kind of ground yourself to the reason why we get motivated to do this work. Um, you know, it's not hard to go into the news to find headlines like this one. This one is from the Yale School of the Environment just about a, two years ago. Um, and it's, it's a news item on a study that, that concluded that uh, one third of cropland in the, in the corn belt has lost its topsoil. And so I, I chased that study down just a little bit further 
Um, and you know, there's there's a lot to, to unpack from this, but the short version is that um, by looking at topographic characteristics of the landscape these scientists were able to identify places that were most likely to have lost their topsoil by looking just at soil horizons and extending that across the corn belt. A, a full third of the A horizon is, is missing from, from the, the upper Midwest agricultural land. And so that's a problem for us, right? If we're concerned about uh, not only environmental quality and, and a green landscape, but also agricultural productivity, uh, if that A horizon isn't there, we're, we're not doing as, as good as we could be and, and that productivity Instead of being in the fields doing good things, it's in the water usually doing bad. And please note who edited. I just yeah. saw that <laughs> Tillman. Yeah, I didn't notice that. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, again, you know, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but a big motivation behind the the management practices that I'll be talking about in the next half hour, forty minutes or so is to transition from an agricultural production system like this one where we have bare soil on the field during this time of year, whether it's under the snow or not, um, and bare soil between the rows during the rest of the growing season uh, to a management system like this one where uh, we have command, basically a companion cropping system where we're growing clover and can grow on the fields year round. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but we can plant our, our primary cash crops like corn or soybeans directly into the clover. Um, and so this is this is one of the things that we aspire to do. Uh, we think that there's a lot of potential benefit here in terms of keeping soil on the landscape, but I'll show some, some data to talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's not all easy. Uh, there's a lot of management considerations that go into this, and that's been a big focus of the work that John Baker and John Alexander have been doing. And it's also a motivation for the work that we've got funded by Forever Green going forward. And I think that's most of what I want to talk about today. Uh, and I'll, again, um, I'll talk about this in, in pretty broad brush strokes. I'll talk about some of the general conclusions that we've seen so far from, from the research and from this research, and then where we think we can be going from there. Um, so here, Clover. Originally from the Caucasus region, uh, which is useful for us, it's in the sense that it's on the basically the same latitude as the upper Midwest, so that makes it cold tolerant, drought tolerant, it's winter hardy, it's, it's a legume, so it can fix nitrogen, and it's rhizobitus, which is uh, really useful in terms of its ability to, once it's established, to fill in gaps that can be uh, produced when we're establishing crops. Uh, it's perennial, it's long lasting, there are uh, no knowledge of cure stands that are in excess of 30 to 40 years old, old and they're still going strong. Uh, it's got well-established roots. Again, it can, it can tolerate this, this cold climate. Uh, winter hardy, important. Uh, protein content is, is good for forage, um, although you, you wouldn't, I don't know much about forage, but I know that you can't feed this to cows directly for reasons like growth. So uh, it can be mixed into other forage mixes. Uh, it's shade tolerant, which is an important feature of the clover in terms of this production system, because we need something that can survive underneath the, the primary crop. And then also, interestingly, um, and I'll get into this at the very end, in terms of thinking about future directions, uh, is it's very pollinator friendly and, and may be a, a valuable source for honey. Just another look at some of the root systems that we can get from, from established cure clover stands. Um, so I mentioned that it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, once the clover has been established, which can take some time, uh, uh, typically a couple of years of, of establishment before you can start planting a, a crop into it. Um, uh, early in the season, uh, prior to planting, uh, we'll go in and mow the clover biomass back to kind of slow it down a little bit. And then we need to do some sort of disturbance to, to uh, basically prepare the seed beds. So this can be done uh, typically through zone tillage, which is some of the research that John has worked on previously, or even knocking it back with the herbicide. Um, following planting, uh, the, then it's a race between the crop to emerge and the clover uh, that wants to rebound from, from the, the earlier insults that it took through the tillage practices and the early mullet. And so oftentimes we need to go, go in and uh, selectively suppress the clover to give the corn or the soybean crop a chance to get up above the canopy. And that's that's a challenge. That's the tricky part. Uh, that's one thing that we're trying to solve with the work that's going on down at Rosemount and soon to be starting in Lamberton. Uh, and and um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. 
Uh, there's a nice little photo tour of what this system can look like. So, you know, early May in a pre management state, we can see the residue from last year's corn crop. Uh, importantly, the residue can't be left on the field following grain harvest. Uh, so this this doesn't work in what many people will consider to be like a traditional no-till system where we're leaving a lot of residue back. We need to remove that residue. And so it needs to occur in concert with an operation that can make use of it, forage or something like that. Uh, but the clover is already we're already green by mid-May. And this this is an environmentally sensitive time in Minnesota. This is when there's a lot of excess water and soil moisture, especially this coming spring. I think we can anticipate there's a lot of that. And uh, this is when any excess precipitation on the landscape generates a lot of runoff uh, and with the uh, nutrient flux and sediment. So a week later, uh, the clover is mowed to, to knock it back a little bit and then I go into preparing the seed bed. In this case, uh, this was then done very via strip tillage. There's other tillage, uh, another tillage implement I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. And again, it can also be done with, uh, with herbicide. So this this particular year, what year was this, John? Do you know when these pictures were taken? This was probably 2018. Um, so at one point they started building houses over there. Oh, <laughs> there'd be houses in the back of the before the university kicked us out. <laughs> uh, and by the end of May, you can see uh, the, the crop is starting to emerge. And once we get into mid June, we can see that uh, it's now a race, a race for sunlight and, and, and soil resources between uh, the corn plant and, and the clover. June 14. And then finally, once you get to late June, you can see that the, the, the corn canopy has extended above the clover. So it's, it's won the race off the starting line and uh, assuming abundant soil moisture resources. Uh, the clover doesn't pose a problem to the corn crop going on into the season from here on out. Have you guys ever, I can't remember some of your previous presentations, have you ever looked at utilizing the corn store in, in a way to manage the redevelopment of, of uh, the current? Right? I mean, in other words, you know, using it to not kill, but using it as a type of mulch over the uh, the cura to reduce its competitiveness. Be touching. Yeah, I've always been curious about that, but I've never really uh, had an experiment where I did that in a replicated way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but it's, it would be, it's an interesting question. Do you be concerned about soil temperature under that mulch thing? Well, it wouldn't be in the, it wouldn't be in your till row. Yeah. It'd be the mulch over Position over the current. Be an interesting experiment project, an uh, interesting project to see what level of that's what I mean. Of yeah, yeah, return yeah. and how yeah, what the option to be positioned. Yeah, yeah. Probably have to shred it. Yeah, there there is kind of an interaction between um, like the rotation and the um, and like the the vigor of the clover in the following spring so if you you know have a couple of years of row crops in there that clover is a lot more sluggish so um when we really have problems is when we're coming into a pure clover stand yeah well based on everything i've seen we need we need to we need to figure out how to make the curd clover a little more sluggish yeah right. so corn on corn on corn <laughs> no, I'm terms of managing the, the clover. Right? Well, no, but that would that would help. No, I understand, but I'm thinking about other other technologies that can be used to make, but no matter what system you're in, to make that curd clover a little more sluggish without yeah. killing it. It's a two-edged sword, though, right? I mean, like in a, a, a year like this one, when we anticipate that the soil is going to be pretty saturated, you want that early season ET. Yeah, from this, this topic about clover. Oh, oh, last year, a novel. I understand, but I also want a consistent corn yield. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, there's two. From a farmer perspective, uh, yeah. that's pretty important, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's two, two suggestions in the chat right on this point. So Carmen asks if anybody has used row shavers. So I think that would basically be like inter-row mowing that would come in and when they're at that competitive point, not mm -hmm. back the curb. The and Lee suggests flaming. Oh, yeah. 
But we did talk a little bit at one point about <clears throat> developing uh, some sort of ganged mower similar to that the rotary zone tills uh, device that we developed. But you know that'd be that'd be a slow process. Another process that you'd have to do at a time of year when when time is short. Yeah. Uh, your, but it's an interesting idea. Get your your robot drones mm -hmm. there to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Can't uh, can't embarrass us. Have you talked to the board geneticists that they can not? Find a way to do a little modification on it. Uh, yeah. shot, I suppose. There, there is one guy who's doing cure breeding with the Land Institute, Brandon Schlaubert. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what. I think he's working mostly on establishment problems. Yeah, make make it a little more sluggish so that it only produces one seed per acre. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't even seed production, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, you know, late in the season, you can see that the, the clover is still there. It's not real vigorous under under the standing crop. So the shade, so the shade has taken it from that robust stand to this. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then once once you harvest and remove it, then, uh, then the, the clover will get reestablished or kind of begin to grow again before winter conditions set it under. But as I mentioned previously, um, you know, or at least for now, we need to remove that stover. Uh, we need to find something to do with it. So if you just shred it, that's not enough. Um, I don't know. Probably try it. I don't know. It would be hard. Something to test, but I, I would imagine it would it would cause problems. So, the, so it's either coming back and picking it up off the ground from this state, which I imagine would also be, could be fairly disruptive to the cure, but that that's successful, you're able to come back and remove it, no problem. Yep. Okay. I mean, if it was silage, right, it would be yeah, gone immediately. So. There's typically markets for it, too. It's not, not a big money maker, but break it and nail it does a decent job. And by that time, you saw how much clover there was above ground. There wasn't much, so it's it's really not hurting it too much at this so point. So that would be another way to position the system would be in the silage corn systems in Wisconsin and Minnesota, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so so that's the kind of the, the management of the system in a nutshell. Um, and a lot of that has been, you know, initially conceived by Ken Albrecht up in Wisconsin. And then from there, um, John set up some uh, uh, long-term experimental plots down at Rosemount and uh, looked at some long-term impacts of cured clover on soil property and maturation. Uh, and so the data I'm going to show now are from a, a five-year experiment that have cured clover alongside a conventionally managed system. Uh, these are data from both Rosemont and also from Arlington, uh, Wisconsin. And um, yeah, so soil properties at both sites and then uh, infiltration or runoff was only, only measured on a, a steeply sloping site at Rosemont. Um, the results from that, that five-year study show minimally non-significant uh, differences. And so again, carbon and cation exchange capacity. Uh, bulk density was lower in the cured clover, but that was only significant at the RRC site. And then moisture characteristics were, were not different between, between sites. So, uh, and, and this was for how many years? Five? Five, five, five years. Study. And carbon did not change? No. But carbon's a tricky thing. No, you know, I, you know, we all have, but I'm just saying there's another case where carbon difference, even though it was in, in a cover of, with this intensity, carbon did not change. Was it due to the fact that there was tillage? Did I think the it's due to the till, fact that it's it a noisy measurement. Yeah, I understand. I said, really, I mean, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Right? I mean, was it due to the fact that there was tillage, noisy measurements? Yeah, I'm sure that yeah. had an impact. Yeah. And I mean, this will <clears throat> Are we coming on? Uh, there is another data set. What five years up from this? Uh, am I thinking incorrectly? I feel like there's there's more soil data, soil carbon data to be analyzed. There is. We in in, in our new field, we've now got. Uh, well, let's see, be four years okay. measurement. So we haven't looked at the most recent carbon data yet. And you also got to remember, we're taking more carbon off the field with the stove. No, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's maintaining it, and that's yeah. important yeah. still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was do you know if these were sampled, taking into account the zonality of the 
cura system, right? Because in the crop row versus in the where the cura is, it could be quite different. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. We haven't as segregated it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the notable results from that study really came in terms of uh, increased infiltration rates and reduced soil erosion losses. And I'll show those data here. So um, what we're looking at here is uh, 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 saturated hydraulic conductivity or infiltration rates. Um, on the left, so on, I guess the left panel is for month, the right is Arlington. And then within each plant and on the left, most set of data are for the conventionally managed system. Uh, in the middle is a pure chlor cure system, and then on the right is the, the corn grown in the pure clover living mulch. And the, the punchline here is that uh, corn grown in with the, the living mulch has infiltration rates that are as high as what we observe in the pure clover. Uh, and it's an order of magnitude greater than the infiltration rates we see in the conventionally managed system. So thinking back to that, that photo I showed of surface soil erosion early in the talk, um, this is a, a, a benefit that would directly reduce that in terms of having established living cover and, and increasing infiltration rates uh, to reduce overland flow and, and soil erosion from, from surface. What's the point? Do you guys know what the mechanism is for that infantil? I think a lot of it is aggregation. You know, the, aggregation. the cure has such a, a dense uh, mat of, of, yeah. of uh, rhizomes and, and crowns. And, and if, if you look at a picture of, I think, had there was one earlier where I think it was John was holding the uh, some care above ground and you can just see how well aggregated it is. Yeah. and that also gives you a lot better traffic ability we can get out on the on these care systems like right after a rain almost yeah. when you'd be what's the turnover rate of the rise of the system I don't, I, don't know know the, I don't know that that's known and in terms of uh, upper, you know the, the, the change in the structure of the soil is you know microbial driven right mm -hmm. So in terms of how fast are those rhizomes turning over? I, I don't know so, if it's the rhizome turnover. I think that I have, I, I put together a paper that's going to be coming out here soon that uh, looks at biomass inputs. And we're putting in multiple tons of quote, above ground biomass into the system every year. And so I think that that's driving a lot of fungal growth. Um, there's some other evidence. and. Well, that's why I mean microbial turnover. Yeah, but it's above ground inputs instead of turnover from the, of the roots. I saw above ground. Yeah, because you saw it kind of melt away over the growing season. Yeah. You saw it started off with a lot, and then by the end, there wasn't very much above ground biomass. So it's all coming in from above. I don't understand that. If it's melting ground. away, so the, the above ground part, it, oh, I see. So that melting away component, it's well, the decomposition the of the above ground. Above ground. Biomass during the season as the shading increases. But you're suggesting that it's preserving the rhizome structure below ground. Mm -hmm. I would expect that the rhizome turnover is not very rapid. Yeah. You know, it's a, they get kind of woody. Yeah. I'd expect rhizome turnover is pretty slow, but there is some fine rip turnover that I think we don't know a whole lot yeah. about. And I'd, I'd be interested in that question, actually, one of the fine rip turnovers. All right. Um, yeah, so I guess punchline here is, is much greater uh, infiltration rates. And then, uh, you know, similarly, this translates to greater reduced soil erosion rates. Um, so, um, it's holding, so it's holding more water for the corn. Yeah, uh, there's higher infiltration. I wouldn't necessarily say it's holding more water. We didn't really see much difference in the in the uh, moisture the system. system. So it's, it's so higher infiltration. Water, if you're holding more water. So you're getting more of the water to stay in play. Well, well, at Rosemount, you know, it's it's getting yeah, into that yeah, subsoil yeah. that's that's. But you're going to be able to get a handle on that out at Lamberton. Out at Lamberton, I think it may be more beneficial. Yeah, where you've got you know deeper yeah. soil, finer textured soil. But you're going to be able to measure it there with the tile line system. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll be able to quantify what's coming out of that. Um, and then in terms of you know these benefits for from a soil erosion standpoint, you know this is these were pretty steep plots. Um, so important for those plots, but perhaps not typical for a lot of Minnesota farmland in terms of we think about you know, most of the Minnesota River Valley being pretty, pretty flat. Um, I've seen erosion there. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it happens for a lot of reasons too, right? I mean, uh, it doesn't always happen in an off the surface field in terms of 
more erosive rivers with increased water yield and what I mean is real erosion of tree yield by the yeah. does value you guys. <laughs> if you were targeting dairy operations in southeast Minnesota, right? That would be important down yeah. there for sure. Tim Cruz in the chat is asking how those soil loss rates were measured. Uh, I'll defer to John. John. Oh, they were pretty standard erosion plots. It was on a 9% slope down at Rosemount, and we had the, the plots were separated by actually uh, inflated fire hose to prevent lateral movement. And then at the bottom, you know, there was a runoff collection device. Mm -hmm. And we collected it at the, that particular year. There were 10 storms that generated runoff on the on the conventional plots. Great. Right. So uh, just you know a quick refresher. So so you know, early season mowing followed by some sort of tillage or herbicide uh, suppression before planting, and then it's a race between the crop and the clover early on. And so thinking about how that clover biomass changes through time, uh, this is a culmination of a lot of data that John has collected. And you know we've got these different phases. So this kind of early season of vigorous growth is like happening right around the time the planting is occurring, and then that peak biomass, you know, is roughly centered around the beginning of June, where there's a lot of competition happening between the clover and the crop. And so just to kind of point that out, you can see there's a little corn plant and they're <laughs> trying to make a go at things. So so this this is the period that we're really concerned about. And maybe in this sense, we as, as you know producers who are trying to make a living while doing this as well. Uh, and then finally, once once the canopy, the crop canopy gets established, that, that clover becomes non competitive. And so, so so that critical period that you have there, right? So like, we all know corn doesn't like green neighbors. Mm -hmm. Speaking as a weed scientist, right? We know it doesn't like it's really susceptible. So, so have you guys done any suppression studies to get an idea of how much you need to lower that biomass? That's so, kind of what the current project is is looking at in in in, in kind of a way. We're, we're we we have planting date treatments. And so we're gonna have different starting clover biomass and different accumulated growing degree days as the, um, as the year goes on. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting after that. And I've, yeah, we've used several different um, uh, types of management and, and things. So yeah, we, we've kind of in a roundabout way been all of our research is about that. So this falls right in line with the whole issue of weed science of the critical weed-free period. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and the modeling of, of that in terms of when do you have to control the weeds, right? Early competition here, you, you're showing early competition. Most weed systems, you, you don't have much early competition, but you guys do, right? So it's that same model of the critical weed free period. When do you have to have that suppression setting it up so the shade carries it the rest of the season? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So yeah. So you know that sets sets up you know some of the, the motivation for how do we how do we fight that kind of early season competition between the two. Um, and so uh, you know an early early work that that John and John have done on this looked at different established method establishment methods. Uh, so. For suppression methods prior to planting, either using banded herbicides or strip tillage or a rotary zone tillage, which is a much more aggressive form of tillage. Um, it, it, it makes a, a, a wider row and displaces a lot of the residue back into the, the non tilled zones. Um, and you know, I'm greatly condensing here, but the main conclusions for that work is that the strip tillage was superior to the herbicide. Um, and I don't I don't recall exactly from the, the the rotary zone tillage. I think the conclusion there is that it's it's slow and very power intense, and so um, maybe not bad for establishing the crop, but not practical from a, a real economic perspective. How much work was done on the herbicide treatment? 
I actually, I've kind of changed some, changed my tune a little bit on the herbicides. I, I kind of like that. Um, so what, that what did you guys use? We use both in the experiment that we're doing now. It, it's both um, the Orthman strip tillage tool and uh, banded herbicides of dicamba and stinger. I see. Um, and I, I think that 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 the that herbicide combination does a nice job of maintaining a weed free and clover free. But there may very well be other options, right? That's the Wisconsin way of doing it. That's why Ken, Ken has always yeah. done this system. I think it buys you a little bit of time, but we also had some problems last year because if you remember last spring, it was cold and wet and then it was completely dry and hot. And um, I don't know if we had a good no-till planter to uh, make the banded herbicide treatment work yeah, as yeah. well as it should have, yeah. but um, we're, we have irrigation out there. So we'll probably, if, it, if we run into that problem again, we'll, we'll water it a little bit before we get out there with the planter. But I, I do like the banded herbicide. Do you think the soil was too hard to get through with that? Yeah. <clears throat> um, other findings from the, the establishment work that John did. Um, uh, here, soil nitrogen increased by quite a bit, but it happens in uh, in the, the, I guess, adjacent to the zone. So, um, uh, in terms of displaced residue, and it didn't ex that increased residue from the clover didn't really manifest itself into greater soil in at, at later time intervals. And then also I'll show some data that, that John collected showing that there's potential risk for nitric oxide. So the corn was able to pick it up. Still it's some made. questions with that. It seems that way. Or right? Is that a fair statement? I don't I don't know. Well, I've got data. I've got data. I've got your uh, I got so um <laughs> right, that so, the inclusion in one of the papers though, right? And most of the like mineralization of the clover residue was. I mean, it's occurring in, in the clover row. No, if you was, it down on the paper, you're going to be held accountable. Yeah, it was that was in stone. Yeah, so that was according to that root that data, yeah, and right. so I don't know. Um, yeah, I have those. I have those data coming up. Okay. We we can't really know um, the efficiency of uptake of. Clover supplied nitrogen without like a different tool, like isotopes or something. Mm -hmm. Supplied one more. Yeah, would be a good idea. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what else I have to add on this. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into the end management in a second. I think that might offer some insights into the, the, the comments I get up here on on the rotation. And, and so this the this species causes bloat. That's the issue. That's what I've heard. For mm -hmm. it's pretty rich. Oh, okay. Well, sheep, sheep seem to do okay. Sheep do fine on it. But the cattle would have problems, just like with giraffe elements. So it's in the same game, mm -hmm. same level of potential so. blow as alfalfa. I think so. I, I've never seen studies relating the two, yeah. but that's been my impression. I know Josh wouldn't. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if there's been a direct comparison, but yeah, I know the risk of blow is high. I mean, it's pretty pretty protein rich. Which would it, would about five percent nitrogen. Yeah. So, like that's. But you know, we do feed the alfalfa. In yeah. rations. In rations. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm just saying. Yeah. And I'm sure it's not completely outside. No, it, it's, it's it's certainly usable. Yeah. But one of the issues too is is you know harvestability of something like this for forage, right? It's not it, its growth habit is a little lower, a little more yeah, right. prostrate than in alfalfa, so it doesn't lend itself quite as well to harvest. Not that it's impossible. But. Uh, so, the another set of experiments that John did on this was to look at kind of end management implications of the system, and uh, I'll just I'll cut to the chase real quickly on that. So he he, he took at, that picture to show the mine, didn't you? The gravel mine. This is in Arlington. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so so. Uh, uh, John set up experiments to look at grain yield responses to fertilizer rates. Uh, and in a couple of years that, or in a 2000, yeah, in two years following uh, the stand that was used as forage, uh, there was essentially basically no fertilizer rate response to speed at all. So there was plenty of nitrogen in the soil. 
for the corn to do what it needed to do. Um, but second year corn, uh, we see very much more typical fertilizer uh, response rate, and and the the corn needed you know about 150 pounds an acre to to achieve its south of yield. Um, so so that, that so it doesn't match alfalfa, right? So alfalfa yeah. stands supporting for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and this basically one year. I don't know if that's then stone mill either. The alfalfa the, work. I bet mean, people in this room say that. <laughs> there's there's always exceptions, but yeah. I don't. It, it, it's a complicated story, but as far as nitrogen requirements for yeah. this system, but I have some other stuff, and we actually replicated the the bottom graph in 2022. By the way, I haven't shown you that graph yet. Is it a similar curve? Yeah, about the same rate. Yeah. I mean that you know that nitrogen credit from alfalfa does vary a lot. It depends on where you're at. Who you ask too. Uh, with I Zika, we apparently we we don't see that response as much, but. Um, we're looking at, but we had a a USDA era scientist. Matt that. Yost was at the university when he pumped. Um, hold on, I got nothing to add to that. Um, yeah, so so um, you know, John's done a nice job of. Of setting up these uh, basically conceptual models supported by data that think about where the nitrogen is tied up in the system between the clover biomass and soil organic matter and mineralized nitrogen in the soil. And what does that mean for uh, crop nitrogen requirements? Um, but we also know that the clover is a legume, right? And we it's, it's fixing a lot and it's still present in the system, you know, after two years when we're growing current. So, so why do those? Nitrogen requirements change based on stand history, and and that that further gets refined in the portion of where is the nitrogen going. I think that you mentioned previously, that. and um, you know to answer that, John looked for basically where are the roots in these systems, and you know in in the crop row itself, there's a lot of corn roots, and virtually none as you get out into these these intervals away from the row, and it's it's the inverse relationship for the clover root. So the clover. Uh, they're fixing a lot of nitrogen, but they're not doing it in a location in the soil that the corn is necessarily absorbing at all. Uh, so, so what initially was perceived as this win-win in terms of the clover providing a lot of nitrogen inputs for the crop is maybe less clear. Um, and so we need to think about ways, you know, perhaps there's different ways to manage this system that allow those things to cooperate with one another a little better. Um, What's the range of root architecture for the maize? Do we have horizontal maze lines? Have you, have you ever seen those classic uh, photos of weavers from back in the 1920s? Or, you know, it, it shows a pretty vertical architecture for, for corn root systems. So I wonder how much genetic vari variation. I, I don't know. There must be substantial genetic variation, but I, I'm not, that, that's not an area I know a lot about. Yeah. I'm sure there is. Yeah. There was a lab working on that at Penn State. They, they were trying to get roots down fast cheaply for low resource soils, but you know, they had plenty of variability as, as far yeah. as I understood. Do the inverse of that. Take right. yourself and do a one over. <laughs> you can't do it. I think that other check, right? For a system like this and other systems. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so I, you know the conclusion conclusions from that work is that you know despite the 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 inputs from the clover, it's not necessarily in a place where the corn can access it. Um, and so um so we, we suspect, or I guess conclude from that, that those changes in that management requirements due to the stand history are, are a, a result of that kind of vertical location or the spatial arrangement of, of the crop and, and uh, the clover. And then finally, to close out with some, some maybe less rosy results, um, uh, John also went out and, and measured nitrous oxide flux and the row and the inter row. Um, and uh, and, and maybe a little bit of background here. Nitrous oxide, for those of you that may not be aware, is it's a really potent greenhouse gas. And it's longer lived in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And so it's something that we have to be very worried about in those here at the dentist. I guess you're, then you're worried about it for other reasons. But um, the, the punchline here is that in, in the clover stands and in the inter row, there, there were high nitrous oxide fluxes. 
that can we attribute to decomposition of the polar residue? Because it's dying. Yeah. Uh, and um, the, the mechanisms for that and, and whether that behavior would persist in, a, in an undisturbed clover stand is something that we don't know yet, but I'm aware of. Um, so I think there's more experimentation to be, to be done on that. Um, but if, if we're thinking about, you know, the, the I guess, grand total environmental footprint of this system, this is something that we need to do an important job quantifying. Does this chart represent, you know, multiple readings across the whole season averaged or because like even the spikiness within the interrow where it doesn't really track the end rate suggests there, that maybe yeah. there was 28 measurements. So it was twice weekly throughout okay. the growing season, oh, wow. trapezoidal integration and uh, restricted quadratic estimation of the flux. So yeah, mm -hmm. everything was done according to Rod. So it was all good. Wow. Um, that high variability on in the interrow. So uh, that to me suggests that there's potentially hot spots of microbial activity. Um, I took all these measurements and every time I went out there in the morning, I took them at 10 a.m. Every time I went out there, my boots would get soaked. And so there was a lot of dew, even though there wasn't any rainfall necessarily, there was a lot of dew. And with this high nitrogen biomass, even partially, partially decayed um, residue, you could get an anoxic um, environment potentially. So this is all theor theoretically, but you can get an anoxic environment on one of those leaves um, and have denitrification on the surface. So how would this compare, say, with, with uh, alfalfa crop? <clears throat> I, I don't have... Uh, there's there's been some similar results. So one of the one of the studies I'm, I can recall right now is is thinking about like I mean it's all I think it's a lot is very related to how much uh, biomass is on the surface and the soil moisture conditions. So spring thaw events are actually known hot spots like with alfalfa. It's actually one of the questions I've been thinking about here too is how does our our fall management of the alfalfa impact you know, the amount of biomass we have and then in these spring freeze thaw cycles are nitrous oxide emissions. Because I think it's just, it's just the same, it's the same game, high nitrogen residues present on the soil surface when you've got these freeze thaw environments or uh, uh, events and, or in this case, like dew events, right? Or precipitation events, that material's biodegrading on the surface, right? And it's right for loss. So, so is the freeze thaw important from the cell lysis? Perspective. I think that yeah, the, yeah, like cell lysing going on, and we've seen that we see this in like phosphorus runoff too. Without phosphorus right. systems too, you get cell lysing and high phosphorus runoff. But I think the same action is playing into emissions if you've got anoxic conditions on the surface. And Josh, you mentioned earlier about how Kira lays down a lot more than than alfalfa, and so it's going to have more soil oh, content there. there. Yeah. yeah. So I would expect mid season. This cure management system, you might have more emissions um, than you would in say an alfalfa system where you're you're defoliating pretty regularly, right? But that residue that's left behind over the winter period and you know into the wet spring months, that that's going to make a big difference. I would um, assume, but there's not a lot of data and very little data. variability. Wet years, wet yeah. and dry years, yeah. presumably. Uh, tell us again when the when when did you get the highest levels of uh, NOx release. It was still, um, it, it, it's still, the, the, the temporal distribution of it was similar to like the row zone. Um, so it was still centered around rain events early in the growing season. So um, the early. Yeah, yeah. but um, if you look at Peter Turner's paper uh, where he had, um, uh, automatic chambers out there uh in it was a soybean system right or it was corn and soybean system and so uh, i think that was a continuous corn system but i have to go back and look that was seven or eight years ago it was on a private farm down in uh, rice county but this was cura it was cura yeah. and automated chamber and but so you more look continued more frequent yeah and you look at the um the cumulative flux in that system, and it uh, 
it increases later in the in the growing season at the Kira system, whereas the conventional system is is flat. So we're we do continue emitting N2O later into the growing season, at least according to that study. And then um, whatever. So then I've I've contributed a little bit to that those data. But is anyone doing this type of work in cover crop systems in general? Oh yeah, I've heard a lot of people. So, so does it match this? I've heard people with similar theories out in uh, University of Illinois, I forget his name, but I was talking to him at the at the Tri Societies meetings, and he's come to similar conclusions about uh, hot spots on microsites of residue in, in rye, cereal rye. Rye, too. Yeah. 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 I've seen that too. Um, I don't if you okay. uh yeah, I'm getting close to the end here. So why don't you go for it and then I'll have plenty of time. There there is if you want to pull up the chat, and since uh, you're the you're sharing that screen, on. um Lee Dahan put a picture, one of those weaver pictures of a root system. Maybe bring if you can get your cursor over. Yeah, well, who gave Lee permission to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I don't know if you can pop that open if that open up by the chat now you have to download it so yeah um looks great on my screen <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe i can do that yeah pete is asking what the scale on the graph is oh you can see it now <clears throat> down to four four feet yeah but, that's more lateral growth than i remember but yeah that looks familiar those pictures are just marvelous to look at a lot of really painstaking work Presumably, this was done with nothing growing between the rows, or even back Correct. then, it might have been a space plant essentially. Yeah. Um, so, we might be seeing now that there's root to root competition and exclusion of yeah, the core impact gets over there. Yeah, so yeah, 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 exactly. it will be push, push so, the environment back. Right. You've seen that in, in agroforestry systems, you know, with trees, but where the roots get trained and they will mm -hmm. literally will go down below the tillage zone mm -hmm. and go out horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, so, they are. Sort of the safety net idea, right? But but with an annual crop again. Corn producing allelopathic compounds is the answer. Mm -hmm. Suppression, <laughs> yeah. Suppressing the clover. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let's see if I can get back to my slides here. Chris, <laughs> we've been disturbing you a lot. Oh, yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe from 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 John's distribution settings, you know, the, the end credits um, in the soil are not from the above ground biomass pools. It's from the the I guess the biomass from the forest system previously. So this is maybe <laughs> okay. What um, did the paper say? <laughs> um, and then that these systems uh, are worrisome potentially for their high end well emissions and, and these the, the locations of these are something that we are still working to understand and um, we need to make sure that we account for that appropriately. Um, all right, so I wanted I'm just going to wrap up the previous sets of conclusions one more time and then move on to some of our future directions for a couple of slides and then I think we can kind of get to our discussion. So, um, you know, we're, we're really optimistic about this system in terms of its benefits for increasing infiltration rates and reducing soil erosion. Um, maybe a useful uh, management practice also for reducing above density and, and fertilizer inputs, but the you know, asterisk there is to acknowledge that, that there tends to be some, um, I guess, uh, plot history that impacts there. So a system used as a forage previous to planting a row crop has, has better nitrogen fertilizer benefits than second year corn, for example. Um, but it can be problematic in terms of uh, being a source of nitrous oxide. And then as we have learned in the last two years, uh, that clover early in the season can um, rob the, the soil of moisture. And in a, a year where you're getting into a drought, um, we see the, the, the negative impacts of that further on down the season. Um, Right, okay, so that's a lot of what we currently know about the pure clover as a living mulch or as just as a, as a perennial crop. Um, and that has set up a lot of thinking about, you know, where can we go next? Um, 
Uh, Jeff Strack says this a lot. I, so I attribute this to you, Jeff, but if, if it, this belongs originally to somebody else, you can let me know. There's, there's no silver bullet um, in environmental and problem solving. But oftentimes we need to rely on silver buckshot, right? There's a lot of small problems that need to be appropriately placed in the landscape. Uh, so here, Clover, I think, can have a role in promoting the idea or the ideal of a forever green landscape. That's probably not the perfect solution everywhere all the time. It's so happening close to animal production systems or places where you have a, a market or a, a use for increased residue harvest uh, are, are probably better places for it. And you know, this is work is ongoing. Uh, we, we still struggle to figure out the best way to manage that early season competition. So the experiments that we have going on right now that are funded by Forevergreen are looking at what are the impacts of those different establishment methods and the timing of planting in terms of, uh, of that competition between the clover and the corn. Uh, so John drove a lot of those experiments down at Rosemont last year. They'll be continuing continuing this coming year. Um, John, now a postdoc with, with Josh, but we've hired a, a new master's student who will be coming in uh, mid-summer and, and she'll be taking over that work. So we're really excited to have Mimi join us. Um, there's other things that we, we don't know quite so well yet that we're still working to quantify. Um, the water quality in, impacts seem to be, it seems to be a net benefit in terms of reducing nitrate loss. Um, but this, this is based on measurements from lysimeters or Rosemount. Um, not typical for much of Minnesota's agricultural landscape. And so the tile drainage plots that we're setting up at Lamberton, we hope to use to address that, that question. Um, soil carbon, uh, it's a tricky thing to measure. So we're, we're continuing the long-term studies to look at that. Soil health, I don't know if Anna's on the call, Anna Cakes, um, but I put this on there for her. Um, there's some ideas here that, you know, the presence of clover in these systems can be beneficial for overall soil quality. Um, but we need somebody who's got the right skill set to, to quantify those things and turn that into meaningful information. Um, uh, Cura can be, uh, uh, we think Cura can be really beneficial in the sense of pollinator habitat, in particular for honey production. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. We're just in the beginning phases of thinking about how this system, not the living mulch system, but Cura as a, as a crop might be, might be useful for a multifunctional agricultural landscape. And then um, the N2O emissions, I think we, we, we need to do more to understand what's happening there. Right, okay, so go back in time about a year, not quite a year. Uh, this is uh, the, the Southwest Research and Outreach Center at Lamberton. Um, these are the plots right across the street from the, the main office. And uh, there's existing tile lines there, but last April we went in and we modified those to set up a series of essentially four, four blocks, treatment blocks, and we've got uh, the, the tile lines coming out of those are um, set up to be instrumented. So we're getting those uh, flow monitors and water quality monitors to be put in place this year. The clover was planted last year and is getting established. And so we've got one more establishment year for the clover before we get into treatments down at those sites. Um, so that's happening down at Lamberton. We're excited about that. And then uh, the, 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 these new options that we're thinking about in terms of places that clover can be beneficial. And then, John, I don't know if you want to talk about this or if you want me to. I can go ahead and through. present it. Um, I've thought for a long time that Cura has properties that would really make it a, an excellent ground cover option for agrivoltaics because it's low growing, it's critical, because it's long lived, um, that you don't have to come in and replant it, uh, because you can take. Uh, forage off of it that's uh, nutritious for cows in particular, but also can be grazed by uh, sheep if you want to. But uh, the shade tolerance is still an interesting question. I mean, we know that it, it can persist under corn, but it does thin out with time. But that's one of the things that we want to look at is how well it performs if it's, if it's in a long-term shade environment under solar panels. Um, of course, it's 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 a legume. Uh, we get those high infiltration rates, which are important in in uh, uh, solar farms. That's one of the things that that permitting entities look at when they're permitting a solar farm is whether they can handle the the concentrated runoff that you get, um, and the erosion protection I think is important in that system as well. And then also the the pollinator friendly aspect of it because you can produce, that's another way to maintain productivity in these systems is to just use them for honey production. 
if you don't mow it at all. Um, and uh, so I had been thinking about this for quite some time. And then I found out uh, last year that Flint Hills Resources, the refinery down there, Rosemount, uh, is putting in a, a 45 megawatt solar facility. It's a, it's a one of a kind system in the sense that it's, it's a large uh, solar farm where all of the uh, electricity that's produced is gonna be used on site to, to help power the, the, the refinery. And it's a, I think, 300 acre uh, facility. And so I, uh, I approached them about the, the possibility of, of looking at Kara Clover as a, as a ground cover option, if they would be interested in participating in a research project. And they jumped at the chance and offered us uh, a 40 acre field that's part of the, of the new solar farm. And it's outlined in red down there at the bottom where we're gonna be planting Kara this spring. Uh, the rest of it will be in what's typically used in these solar farms, which is a pollinator friendly mix of uh, um, lots of variety of native plants. Uh, Marla tells me it doesn't produce much honey. <laughs> uh, so that will that would be a, a, a difference here because uh, Kara is, is highly productive in terms of honey production. So uh, we will be planting that and at the same time, if, if you want to go on there, uh, we'll be putting in a, a, a dummy array in one of our existing Cura fields so that we can get a head start on looking at how well the Cura performs uh, in these systems. And so we'll be putting in several rows of, of solar panels. Uh, these will be in a fixed array south facing at a 30 degree tilt, which is different from what they have in mind. They're, they're, they're using a really kind of... Uh, uh, different setup where, where the solar arrays will be running north and south and they'll be flat but solar but solar tracking. So uh, they'll they'll tilt to the east in the morning and then at midday they'll be flat as a tabletop and then in the evening uh, facing west. Uh, we don't have the resources to set up something similar to that in our dummy array. So we'll be looking at what's actually much more common on the landscape right now and that's fixed arrays. There are several good size installations down that way that are very similar to this. This particular photo was taken down on 190th Street in the DNR land, uh, uh, well, just adjacent to DNR land, south of the station. There's a large fixed array. There's also a large fixed array surrounding the Empire Treatment Plant down there, Farmington. So we'll be kind of mimicking that and looking at, at just how the clover behaves as a function of where it is. Uh, on a on a transect perpendicular to 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 the rows and and particularly focusing on on uh, radiation distribution in this system and and how well we can and then we'll be measuring productivity and measuring the amount of flowering that takes place and relating that to uh, position within the array and the amount of uh, solar radiation they're receiving and also be looking at distribution so soil moisture beneath the system. Um, so yeah, go ahead. And longer term, we've been thinking about uh, whether this has some potential for uh, distributed agrivoltaics research. And what we have in mind here is, is, is addressing some of the objections that have been raised to solar arrays in rural environments. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the objections that's raised is a bit of a red herring in the sense that you know, there's concern that it's taking land out of production. Um, the amount of land that's that's being devoted, even with the most rosy projections, is pretty small relative to uh, total cropland area out there. But uh, we we do think it's worth considering whether we can maintain some level of agricultural production in these systems, and that's why I think Kira has some potential. I think there are probably other forever green crops that have some potential in that regard. But the other concern is with single massive systems. And this is actually an idea that, that uh, I got from Pat Hamilton at the Science Museum. Um, and that is instead of, instead of setting up a massive array in, in a quarter section of the field, uh, he was suggesting that we can go in and identify small chunks of field that are hard to farm anyway because of the shape of them. And this was particularly the case along uh, streams. And, and so if we can go in and identify those locations 
and, and convert those to perennial vegetation with solar arrays on top of them, we can get some water quality benefits out of this as well, and also distribute the, the, the solar production over multiple landowners so that more people are benefiting from it financially. And, and in, in and a side benefit is that it can eliminate some of the chunks of fields that are, that are hard to farm. And so this is just, we just went in with, uh, we have some GIS people working with us who were able to go into a watershed where Brent and I have been working on water quality research. This is High Island Creek uh, out near Arlington. And so uh, Sarah Porter, who's a GIS specialist working with us, uh, went in and identified um, likely locations so that we can could potentially go in and establish a dozen, say 10 or 12 uh, small areas that could be converted to agrivoltaics. Um, and uh, uh, so the total out of here, you get a, 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 you know, a substantial amount of, of solar energy production, but, but it's distributed amongst, again, as I said, multiple landowners. And this particular watershed has a transmission line running right down through it anyway, and that's the red line. There. And that's one of the main considerations with where where solar is feasible anyway is where you've got transmission line capacity. So this is another area that we're, we're hoping to ultimately uh, have a look at. And we think, again, we have some potential for perennial vegetation beneath solar arrays to get both the, the uh, um, energy benefit from it and, and the water quality benefits. And uh, one last thing that I would mention that I think is, is, is a, is relevant to this discussion of taking land out of production. And that is that a lot of the land that we're talking about is in corn that's used for biofuel production. And if you put solar arrays on that land instead, you get about 18 to 20 times more energy out of there than you do if you convert that corn to, to uh, ethanol. Yeah, there was a letter to the editor about that. Yeah, I saw that. Marvelous. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I guess I had one like, well, yeah. oh yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's, it, it's a marvelous honey producer. So yeah, I, I think that about wraps it up. Um, I thank you all for your, your kind of attention. And um, I guess I don't know, I mentioned I'll let you describe. Sure. In terms of yeah, questions from the room. We've got some, some comments in the chat and questions. So we'll just. Well, I've been. Curious. I've been looking for wondering about what alternative uh, intercrops might be used in hazelnuts. I've been using um, a mix of white clover and fescue. What I find is that white clover is beautiful, establishes well initially, um, but then dies out over over time. And I I think it probably is shade intolerant, but I'm not completely sure. So I'm wondering whether cur clover might be better. Now in our research field, we want to be able to walk through those hazelnuts. So I don't I don't recall that anybody said how tolerant cura clover is to mowing. But in production fields, I don't really see a reason why the farmer would need to keep them mowed. So I'm wondering if that's something that you guys would be interested in working with us to figure out um, sure. it's suitable. Yeah, I, you know, it, it tolerates it tolerates traffic relatively well. It does, okay. and uh, and it's it's longer lived than white clover, certainly in this part of the world. I think. So, um, One slight problem we have with the clover is that I've discovered that it is very attractive to some hazelnut pests. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to attract lots of things that find it tasty. Um, I think deer are attracted to it, rabbits are attracted to it, gophers are attracted to it. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. But those are not <laughs> big enough reasons not to plant it. Yeah. We just have to implement. I mean, we probably have to control for those things anyway. Yes, at their mission. Um, <clears throat> speaking of what to put under a solar array or maybe a hazelnut planting, Don Bellison asked about fine fescue mixed with Cura and up your solar arrays as an option. And I don't know, Don, Don, do you want to unmute yourself and lay out some of your thinking about what the benefit would be of adding fine fescue there? 
Well, I think uh, hard or one of the non-creeping uh, fine fescues uh, are shade tolerant, uh, not very competitive, low growing. Uh, I don't know, it may have some application, at least in the short term till, uh, and if there is some shade tolerant issues uh, in certain areas under the array, the fescues may fill in the gap a little bit there. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, reasonable. The, there might be some issues with that. I don't know in a grazing situation or, you know, but I would think it might uh, might have some application, potentially at least. Might, might affect you mix with the clover help mitigate some of the nitrous oxide challenges? I'm sorry, say that again. Might it help mitigate some of the nitrous oxide issues? My sense with the nitrous oxide is that it's mainly a function of uh, vegetative dieback um, okay. as that corn canopy gradually develops. Uh, but it's certainly one of the things that we want to look at when we put it in a solar array as well. Right. You're not going to have the same temporal distribution of biomass where we see a big flush of growth in the early spring because there's no shade and then it gets shaded later on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know what to expect under. Uh, uh, continuous shade. Yeah. Well, the hazelnuts would not provide shade as much shade early in the spring before yeah. they leaf out. How early do they leaf out? Um, depending on the season, they don't achieve full canopy until sometime in the early spring. That might actually be a nice, a nice match. Yeah. Well, and in your plantations, Lois, I mean, are you, you're not getting full canopy closure across alleyways between plants. Well, that's something we're, we still haven't figured out optimal okay. spacing. Okay. Um, and some visions, some people envision planting hazelnuts close enough that, that you do get yeah, you would. full canopy coverage. Mm -hmm. I personally, for my system, where I need to access the plants, that's not desirable. And also, then I have seen places where the hazelnuts are planted 10 feet apart. They do shade out the row. We can't get in there to do anything, mm -hmm. and the ground cover is completely filled out. Mm -hmm. um, wider spacing will probably be necessary just to get when we have our mechanical harvest Harvest system, machinery, yeah. We need someplace for that machinery to run. Mm -hmm. John Baker, a note on the uh, Flint Hills project. So Peter LaFontaine. <clears throat> From the Friends of the Mississippi River said that they're working on that project too. They're, yes. And they're bringing on a uh, pollinator biologist to do monitoring. So if you're interested in collaborating with them, that I actually sent them an email earlier this week. I haven't heard back yet. Oh, but okay. Yeah, I was aware that they're the one, they've been working with Flint Hills for quite some time on the natural area that they own to the east of the of the refinery over towards the river. So okay. I'll uh I'll let them know to to check their email. They're always um they, they haven't figured out computers yet. They're too busy mucking around in the dirt. <laughs> Where are they finding any dirt? There's still two feet of snow out there. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, this is really fascinating work. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing the updates. Excited to see yeah. what comes next, especially the new Lamberton plots. We'll we'll get so much resolution on. Uh, water quality, drainage amounts. Yeah, so. we're excited about that. Um, one thing I didn't mention, another part of, of that work is, you know, we're collecting or aggregating data to ultimately build up the, the framework for representing pure clover model, mm -hmm. or, you know, like the SWOT model is one thing I do a lot of. So Great. Um, it might not be a perfect representation of the system from an economic standpoint, but if we can at least Hit the high points in terms of some of the environmental responses for this this living home system, then you can start to play some games with you know looking at it across the bigger landscape and identifying where are the places where it really has the potential to give you your greatest benefit. Yeah, great. Do you know anybody that can do those models? Uh, maybe. <laughs> there was one other question I missed. Does anybody know the rooting depth of the deer clover? Most of them are uh, in the top foot. 
Okay. Yeah. Majority of the roots in the top, but I would. I mean, they 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 are deep rooted, but like a major a majority of the rhizome in the biomass is is in the upper layer. Yeah. And I don't know. Has anybody done a lot of real deep sampling in care system? That I'm not remote aware of much, but. We did dig a soil pit in C6 in okay. 2018, probably. Um, and yeah, I, I saw a, a lone root like three foot down, but mm -hmm. yeah, still most of them were deep. The soil carbon data were collected over what depth interval? You know, John? Well, down to one, one meter, I believe. Oh. Yeah, there were multiple depths down there. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank you.